Philadelphia. He returns or calls me home. Either way, I'm going to stand in the power of Christ. In fact, he could come today, as a matter of fact. Just got back from our uh, annual marriage retreat. We did the two weekends in a row. What a phenomenal time. Those who were there, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think as uh, I had several people say to me, I think this is one of the best we've had. So I think they say that after every year, though. So. <laughs> But they do get better. It's just been a phenomenal time of the Lord. And just each weekend was a great, great experience. And uh, man, God's good all the time. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you today. Uh, we're returning back to our messages called Back to the Future. We're in part four on the signs of the time. Uh, we need to understand very clearly the day and the age in which we live. A lot of people, you know, not only do they mock the Christian, they mock this, this theology and this doctrine that says Jesus Christ is going to come again soon, but you better face the facts, amen? It's amazing what's going to happen. We've had, uh, somebody bring that to me, would you? <laughs> We've had uh, a lot of talk in the last weeks about the return of the Lord and what's gonna happen in the last days and what we can expect to happen. And uh, I have this chart that I've been showing you each week and. Sometimes it'll be more detailed than others. Thank you, ma'am. Y'all give her a praise to the Lord, would you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it working now? Now, now you got to make it work. Can you reset the presenter there? But, and, and go forward one slide while you're doing that. On the chart, it talks, uh, gives kind of an overview of what the end times will be like and what the last days will be like, all right? And uh, can we get the chart up at least? Yes, no, maybe so. Come on, she's just starting out back there. Help her out. She's in panic mode. I always think that Brother Joe's going to kill me after the service, you know. I haven't killed anybody yet. <laughs> but we need to understand why they're getting that ready. Let me just remind you, you know, that about 260 chapters in, in the Bible, in the whole Word of God, uh, there's about 300 mentions of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I mean, you have to understand that there's two real important doctrines in Scripture. There are many, they're all important, but there's two the major themes. Are one is salvation, all right? And the other major theme is on prophecy and the return of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So, uh, they're really the same because all our salvation, uh, it, it basically culminates in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where that when we see him, we're gathered with him, then all that our salvation was about is made complete and made full because we're forever with the Lord at that point and all God's people are righteously gathered around the throne. About every prophecy in scripture about the first coming of Jesus, and there's a lot of scripture that just give us the testament and the, and the promise that there'd be a coming Messiah and a savior. There's many of them, but for every one of those, there's eight more that talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have to realize there's just a lot in the word of God that's discussed in scripture about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You just can't escape it. It's a, it's a solid fact. I know that we, if we listen to the world and we listen to the media and we listen to popular philosophy and popular worldviews that you know, you, you come up with all different kind of crazy, sordid things, but the truth of the matter is, whether you believe the Bible or not, it's the facts, and the facts have been proven. And one thing that really points out to the integrity of Scripture and how, how, how authoritative the Scripture is, you just look back and see everything that was prophesied that has already happened, all that has already come forth and already that has taken place and, and, and all that God has done and will be doing. So let, let's, let's just mark it down. Jesus Christ is, is coming again very soon. Uh, I'm going to pass the chart. Let me just read some scripture. If you have your Bible, you can open to Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, we've looked at this passage a couple times, but I want to add a couple more verses down into the chapter that we've been talking about. And if you have your smartphone, you can use it in your Bible. You know, there's no sin against using your smartphone for your Bible, okay? I know some churches there are, but it's okay here. As long as you're not doing Facebook time. <laughs> In, in, in chapter 24, verse one, it says, and Jesus came out from the temple and he was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he answered and said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another stone, which will not be torn down. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? What's the sign of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ and they will mislead many. And you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. 
See that you're not frightened for these things must take place, but the end is, is not yet the end for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there's going to be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. If you go down to verse 32, if you got your Bible open in verse 32, he says, now learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch has already come, become tender and it's put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will not pass away. Basically that's Jesus' way of saying at the very end of that, Mark it down. This is the way it's going to be. Remember the disciples, when they came to Jesus, they were talking about the temple and saying, you know, Jesus points out the temple that one stone be turned on another. And as you leave the temple area, they would, they would go over to the Mount of Olives. You have to go leave the temple area. You go out, you know, through, through the Eastern Gate and cross the Kidron Valley. And there you're on the Mount of Olives. It's where often Jesus went. So as they leave the temple and make their way across, that's over there where the Garden of Gethsemane is, by the way. Jesus goes and he sits down with his disciples in one of these areas and they get specific. It says They ask him privately and they ask him three things. If you looked at the passage, when shall these things be? He talked about the temple, destruction of the temple. And then he says, what shall be the sign of your coming? And the third thing they ask, and what's going to be the sign of the end of the world? How can we know that the end of the age has come? And as we've talked about this passage over the last several weeks, we said he referred to signs as he broke down 24, Matthew 24, signs that would be taking place in the globe. What would be happening in the world? And then he talked about not only keep your eyes on there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, plagues, earthquakes, all those things are going to be. We've dealt with that a couple weeks ago. He said, but also there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we also went over the wars of the end times that would be taking place and, and Psalms and Ezekiel, all those wars and Daniel, all those things and the book of Revelation that pointed out to end times wars and nation against nation. And how there's like since the 20th century, there's never been a time in human history where there's been wars like we have wars now. In just the 20th century wars alone, the, the, the deaths that recorded result of war in the 20th century alone, now that we're in the 21st, but in that war alone, you all, if you took all the wars of recorded history and added all the casualties that historians have, have written out over those great wars, they still wouldn't even match the numbers of the 20th century wars. So we're seeing this exponential thing that's happened in the end of time. Jesus said, all these things are gonna get worse and worse. And he said, it's like a woman in travail, like when birth pains start. And, you know, you, he says the various places, this takes place and this takes place. He said, but the closer you get to my return, these things are going to be happening with, with, in greater scope and greater frequency, just like a woman in birth pangs. So it gets to the point, it's just so bad, you know, that before the baby comes, you know, hey, somebody give me an epidural here. That's where the world's going to fail. Somebody do something because it's, it's going to get so drastic. But then he said, what we're going to deal with today is the third part of this science to watch. He said, watch for signs in the Middle East. Look what's taking place in the, and more specifically, he said, what takes place in Israel, all right? And if you'll go down to, 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 it, to a passage there where, where uh, it says Jesus gave the signs, go past that chart. Is it working now? Let me just see if it works for me. Not working for me, so you get to follow along. Maybe it is working for you. There's the passage of scripture we just read. Y'all take a deep breath, we're almost there. <sighs> all right. These are the things he said would take place. And he said, you're going to watch the signs that happen in the world, signs that take place in religion, signs that take place in the Middle East. And that's the focus of our message today. And specifically, he calls it, verse 32, the fig tree. I'm going to give you just a little brief summation of what he's talking about there. Often in the Old Testament, Israel is referred to as the fig tree, among other names and titles, God's vineyard, God's bride, but the fig tree. And if, you, if you're following what's happening in the disciples, because so they're coming out of the temple and he talks about the temple and how the, not one stone will be left upon another. And then as they go out, he's explaining what would take place. But the day before they get it to Jerusalem, on the way in, they pass a fig tree. And it said it was, it's in full bloom and the leaves are on it. And Jesus goes over to get a fig tree. All right. Now, anybody have fig trees in the yard? If you have a fig tree, you know that figs, begin to be produced at the same time the leaves come on. So when the leaves start budding, the fig, tree start, the, the fig tree starts blooming. And it says that Jesus went over and didn't find any figs on the tree. It should have had some figs, but it says, hey, it says, so he cursed the fig tree. 
Now, that was a prophetic event which he would play on later in his words, in his terminology, and he would speak about, and you have to drag all this together. So what you have is this cursing of the fig tree, which represents the nation of Israel. Remember what Paul said, we'll read that passage in a little bit about how there would be blindness in part in the nation of Israel. All right. And the time of the Gentiles would come, which is the church age that we live in now. This time where people from all backgrounds, nationality, races, the world is open to the cross. Come get saved while you can. Amen. So you have this, this during this time. What has happened? He says, when now that fig tree, when you see it begin to bud and to bloom again, you know that my coming is very nigh. So in other words, he's saying there's a visible sign which theologians for thousands of years have kept their eyes on what has happened to the nation of Israel. Now, remember when Jesus spoke this, 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 this word about the fig tree and the blooming and cursing that fig tree and everything, Israel wasn't even, didn't have national sovereignty, all right? They're no longer a nation. They're now under the domination and the, and the, the, the hard, cruel hand of the Roman Empire. They have been defeated and absorbed. They're no longer a nation. And as you follow the history, as Jesus talked about it, and you follow what the Old Testament prophet said about it, you know, that they'd be dispersed. In fact, if you look at this, you know, look at it, Israel and you open it on a map, you know, you, you wonder why, why is this little tiny place, this little bitty fledgling country with a land space that's hardly any larger than Rhode Island and New Jersey, probably not much bigger than the actual square acreage of Harris County. Why is this little country with a population of just a little over 8 million people, why is it the, the center, the epicenter of all prophecy and all the things that will ha take place in the last days. In fact, if you want to know about Israel and prophecy, Israel is included and involved in 100% of Bible prophecy. You can't get around Israel when it comes to the end times. You realize that all the nation's armament and weapons that are produced by the greater powers of the world, over 50% of that weaponry goes into the Middle East. Because the Bible makes it very clear in Zechariah that there's going to be a problem in the end times. Zechariah put it like this. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. And when they shall be in siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And he says, I'm going to make Jerusalem a heavy stone, you know, a heavy stone for all people. And if you try to lift it, you're going to be severely injured and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. So he says, you know, keep your eyes on the fig tree. When you know that the fig tree begins to bloom, you know that summer is now. He said, listen, I'm at the door. Now, what happened to Israel when Jesus is speaking this? Well, it's a cursed nation. There's, there's, there's nothing going on here. In fact, in Matthew 21, it talks about that. In Mark 11, it talks about that. That happened, that cursing of the fig tree happened in, in 30 A.D., the Jews had pretty much, for the most part, rejected Jesus. Although the apostles, the disciples are Jewish, they end up taking, and the most of the first century church out of Jerusalem was Jewish, they end up taking the gospel to the Gentiles throughout the whole world as they were told to by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus had mentioned though, there's gonna be some things that happen properly. This building's gonna be torn down, talking about the temple. There's not gonna be one stone left upon another. Another time, remember, he's talking about the temple he said, you tear this temple down, referring to his body, I'll rebuild it in three days, all right? But now he's talking about the physical temple, the reconstructed temple that had been reconstructed by Herod. And he says, this temple, not one stone upon these beautiful stones is gonna be left upon it. And it was a beautiful building. It's incredible. You know, you can see, you can go online and see some of the, some of the, 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 the rebuilding, you know, restructuring pictures that have taken place. And if you go to Israel, there's a place that we go to when we do our trip to Israel, that there's, the, we, the city of Jerusalem has been reconstructed in little tiny scale. And you see this beautiful building, this temple that sits there in the middle of the city. It was a massive edifice. On the top, it had like this crown molding, so, but it's hewn out of stone. Beautiful. And then it was, it was painted, not with gold paint. It was painted with paint that was gold, not in color. The, it constituted gold. So they put this layer of gold around it so that when the sun hit it in the morning or, or sunrises or the setting sun, it was just beautiful. It, it, it was just resoundingly attractive. And Jesus said, hey, this, this is great, but hey, all this is going to be torn down. Now, it wasn't too many years, about 30 years after Christ's ascension, that Cestius Gallus, with his Roman legions, came in and he surrounded the city of Jerusalem. There was a Jewish revolt that was taking place. He wanted to capture Jerusalem. He was not allowed to. In fact, it was another general who came in and took over by the name of Titus, who ransacked 
and destroyed the city of Jerusalem as Jesus said it would be. And the temple was completely destroyed. Not one stone left upon another stone. I believe it's Josephus, the Roman historian who made the statement in his writings that the stone was dismantled stone. The temple was dismantled stone by stone because the Roman soldiers saw the gold that was melting down and from the heat of the flames of the city and from inside the temple itself, that that gold began to melt down into the stones so that they dismantled that the temple just to get to the gold that was dripping in between the stones. Whatever the reason was, ultimately the reason was Jesus said it'd be that way. And that's what happened. And the Lord now is saying, you watch the fig tree. Now in that moment and since in history, until recent history, the Jews were a dispersed people, the diaspora. The Old Testament prophets talked about it. The New Testament prophets mentioned it, that the Jews would be scattered across the known world without a nation, without a home, and without a country. And they were for thousands of years. No place to call home. No, no homeland, no, no, no native tongue anymore. In fact, Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel, the prophet is having a conversation with the Lord and the Lord takes him to this vast valley and it's filled with bones and skulls and backbones and legs and arms and, you know, hips. It's just scattered everywhere. That's where that, that old spiritual came from, you know, that the leg bone connected to the hip bone, the hip bone connected to the, y'all don't know that? If you know that, say, uh-huh. Oh, see, you know it, all right. That's where that comes from. Because the Lord says, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel says, well, Lord, you know. And all of a sudden, God begins to move and the bones begin to come together and get connected to the hip bone, to the knee bone, to the toe bone or whatever, all right? To the head bone. And they all get connected. And then something strange begins to happen. Muscle and tissue and sinew begin to grow on the bones in the side of Ezekiel, the prophet. You know, yeah, he's freaking out. I would too, wouldn't you? Like a, like a Tim Burton Halloween movie or something, you know? <laughs> so you're watching this all take place and all of a sudden you have these fully restored bodies and there they are. And then the spirit of the Lord breathes upon them and they come back to life. Now that was a prophetic picture that was not only told by Jeremiah, but other, I mean by Ezekiel, but by other prophets like Jeremiah, that the nation of Israel would be restored and that God would breathe on that nation and bring them back. Well, that seemed like ridiculousness. That's ludicrous. I mean, there's no way that's going to happen. I mean, there's been no tribe and no race and no nationality or country in all of history that has remained a distinct people group outside of a national homeland for thousands of years like the Jewish people had. There's no people on earth that have ever been repatriated after dozens and dozens of generations had even forgotten their distinct national language. There's no people that that's ever happened to in history until the Jews. And it begins to happen. They've been sought after and persecuted even in the darkest hours in Hitler's regime in 1942 when he began attempted to completely wipe out and annihilate the Jewish race. He, in Europe, he kills two out of three Jews in Europe. One third of the Jewish population loses its life in the Holocaust. Six million Jews are killed. But things are happening and God is moving even before this war takes place in 48 and even before Hitler. In 1917, the Jews were given a little bit of land in what we would call in modern language, Palestine, but what would be in the Old Testament language, Philistines, all right, who had taken control of that land. The Palestinians who lay claim to that land really have no biblical claim there. Their claim could only be laid really in Jordan. That's why Jordan doesn't want too many Palestinian immigrants in there because they're not really the natural landowners. They were part of a Heshemite nomadic group. They were given Jordan, those people were, as a result of their allegiance to help, I guess, Lawrence of Arabia in the war, you know. And for all that went on there, that after the World War I and II, those, those parts of the world were divided up by, by Europe and the U.S. and others who played a part. But 1917, there was a little declaration that gave a, 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 a group of Jews a little piece of swampland. It was called the Balfour Declaration. A little Zionist group moves back into, the, into what was their promised land, what is, what is their promise by title. I mean, in fact, you can check a lot of you know, courthouses and, and uh, legal departments for land titles. But hey, there's one title to land that's older than any administration or any government in the world. And those titles are clearly laid out in here. 
and there's a title given to Abraham and all his descendants of a specific geographical territory. The title is clearly laid out. The boundaries are clearly laid out. And God says, this is going to be yours. This is going to be yours. And all people, you know, are going to realize it. And you're going to be a blessing. Well, in 1917, it looked like the sheer demise because when the English and what those who would agree to give the Jews that little bit of territory in the swamps of, of Israel... When they gave it to him, they said, well, it's going to be, it's really all over now because we'll give it to him, but not to sweat because as soon as we leave, the Arabs who surround them are going to completely kill them. And, 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 and that was the pledge that when, when, when England left the shores, all right, and they left behind their occupation of that part of the world, well, they also did kind of like we do when we leave out, we leave a lot of stuff behind and they left trucks and they left tanks and they left vehicles, and they left heavy arms. All that stuff was left behind. But it wasn't left to the Jews. The Arabs took those things. And as they, England left, they kind of looked out the rearview mirror thinking, well, that's probably the last of Israel. Because it was the plan, if you read history, of those Arabs that were surrounding them to destroy the Jews the next day after they left. Well, if you read history, you'll see that, that in the nighttime that the, those Jewish people began to gather together men and women and children and arm themselves with a few weapons that they did have. Having no tanks, they took their cars and their trucks and their pickups and they took the manifolds off of them. Y'all know what a car sounds like when there's no manifold on it? it sounds just like a tank. <laughs> they took 55-gallon drums with large chains and they began to go across in the dark of the night, the desert floor to where those Arab encampments were. They had gathered to destroy them on the next day and began to beat those, 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 those 55 gallon drums as they rolled them across the, with, behind the tanks and stuff. So it sounded like a whole armament of tanks coming in the dark. And it's like something out of these Old Testament stories where you see where God confused the enemies. Those Arabs in the dark of the night, fearful for their lives, hearing all this, this noise coming across the, the, the plain of them, they they gathered together and got out of there as fast as they could. But they also left all those tanks <laughs> and all those heavy guns. Overnight, instant army for the Jews. But it's been ever since they've sought to destroy them. I mean, in June of 67, via our Telstar satellite at that time, the world watched Jerusalem, the war going on via news cameramen, and how Jerusalem was recaptured you know, and by the Israeli people. And they were outnumbered in that war 10 to 1. But you read these events in 1973 was the war, the Yom Kippur War. It's when all the Arab allies surrounding Israel pledged to annihilate Israel, to cut every throat in Israel, drive every Jew into the sea and destroy them once and for all. And they gathered their forces and should have completely annihilated them. But you see one story after another story. And what was meant to annihilate the Jews, not only did the Jews win that battle and win that war, they recaptured much of the territory. The Bible says in the last days, and I, that's a, you know, I, I love history and I love, I love reading history. But if you want a little insight how God miraculously worked in all these wars, I guess it was last year, year before, they did a little video, it was ABC or one of the networks, and they did a, call, a, a, a thing called the Miracle of Israel. It might even last a couple of nights, like a little mini series. And they went back and they interviewed all the oldest people they can find in Israel who were there doing those battles. And boy, you hear their stories. It's phenomenal to hear what took place. And uh, I remember we were on one of our trips to Israel and I was explaining to our group as we were looking up on the Golan Heights, we were on the Galilee, and I was explaining to them the writings of Lance Lambert who recorded history for a lot of these events that were taking place in 67 and 73 and those wars. And Lambert was saying, you know, that when the, when the, uh, the Syrians came up on the Golan Heights, you know, they could have easily rolled down into, uh, into Tiberias and on into Jerusalem and taken it all. But when they got up on the Golan Heights there, where the border is separating Syria and Israel, they came in with hundreds of tanks. I mean, more tanks than in the Battle of the Bulge, all right, World War II. It was a massive display of armament. Down below them were probably less than 100 Israeli tanks and even less soldiers. And Lance Lambert said, as he talked to those tank commanders following that, those battles, he said, on the Syrian heights, you know, that he said, they looked up there and they saw it looked like there was this massive cloud in the shape of a giant hand pressing down on those Syrian troops. I said, I, I don't know if that's factual. You may have been on that trip. 
But if you remember the bus driver stepped forward and he says, I was one of those tank commanders. What you're telling these people is fact. I was there. I saw it. We should have been destroyed. He said, but the Syrians, for whatever reason, they delayed. They were supposed to come on down to me, but they delayed. And they delayed long enough for to, get, to get the rest of our forces in place. Not only did they defeat Syria, they took the Golan Heights, another piece of territory which biblically belonged to them, which is still, according to you, in a contested site. But the Bible says in the last days, I will make Jerusalem what? A cup of trembling. How is it? I mean, how is it that, that this little tiny nation, you know, with none of these great natural resources that the neighbors around them have has become so strong because the Bible says, God said, I will bless them. And you better, you better accept the fact that one day the capital of the world is going to be there. Jerusalem, where Jesus sits on the throne of David. Most of the people in, in our modern culture, if you took a, a poll, would probably tell you that they view Israel as the single greatest threat to world, world peace on the planet. In Europe, a recent poll said eight out of 10 Europeans named Israel as the top contender for that single greatest threat. But you think about it in reality, in the natural, it's really difficult to figure this out. You say, why? Because history demonstrates that there's really been no threat to any society by been, been presented by the existence of Israel, all right? There's no recorded incident in, of Israeli aggression against any other country in the territory apart from a clear instance of self-defense. In 1948, in 1956, 1967, 1973, some of you old enough to remember the history and those wars that took place there. None of those wars or offensive wars for Israel. They were all defensive wars. They never threatened a nation outside them. The combined armies of the Arab world deployed for attack. They openly declared their desire to annihilate Israel and they attacked, but they didn't succeed because the fig tree is budding. May 14th, 1948, the UN declares Israel as a sovereign nation. The reasons behind that one of the main reasons was that the, the world was unhappy that the Jews had gone out after Hitler had been decimated. They went out and found one of the biggest Nazi henchmen responsible for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of deaths of Jews, a man by the name of Eichmann. They found him in Brazil. They brought him back to Jerusalem, put him on trial and hung him in the street for his crimes against humanity. UN gets upset about that. They're mad about that. And they begin to rebuke them and say, you don't, you, you don't have the right to do that. You're not even a country. Well, and shortly after that, they thought it'd be real smart to go ahead and accept Israel as a nation so they could reprimand them. And May 14th, 1948, a resolution was signed that Israel is now a nation. At that point, they began to light into them as much as they could on the floor of the UN to when Golda Meir, who was then the ambassador for Israel, she stood up. She later became the prime minister. She stood up before the whole United Nations Council and said, listen, I appreciate your efforts here, but Israel is now recognized by the UN as a, as a sovereign nation. Therefore, you don't have any right to tell us what to do. End of case. Instant nation. This is the grace of God, though. But Israel and the prophecy of Israel being restored, it, that's miraculous that that can happen after 2,000 plus years or more of non-existence as a sovereign. And not only that they've come back, they've come back by millions, millions. We first started taking trips to Israel in, 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 the, in the mid 70s. And I can remember getting off those planes and you know, whether we flew KLM or Air France or Air, whoever we took in there, we'd get off our planes and there'd be a, there'd be a dozen other 747s parked out from all over the world with people getting off those planes, not as tourists, but coming back from all over the world. To live in Israel as Jews, to be nationalized, to embrace a national language that had long been lost, the Hebrew language. It's been, it's been miraculous, but God said in, in scripture and prophet after prophet, said, God, I'll bring them back from all over the world. And what we have seen, and those of you who, who have been alive since 1948 or recently after that, you, what you have seen, whether you realize it or not, is a supernatural occurrence that is a prophetic fulfillment of what was said thousands of years ago. Amen. That's a God thing. <laughs> now catch this, what Jesus said, hey, when you see these things come to pass, you need to be aware that my coming is nigh and it is even at the door. Zechariah goes on a little bit later in verses 8 and 10. It says, in that day, the Lord 
the end times, after the Lord revives them, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the one who's feeble among the, the Jews in that day will be like David and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. In that day, I will set about to destroy all those nations that come against Israel. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication and they will look to me and on me, catch this, on whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like weeping bitterly over a firstborn loss. What's he saying? Now catch this. I want you to understand this chapter was written 600 years before the cross. But what did he say? They will look up on the one whom they have pierced. Well, who is that? What's that mean? That's 600 years before Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. Isaiah said he would be pierced. Zechariah said he'd be pierced. The prophets before said he'd be a sacrifice like a lamb. He, he, he would bear our sins. He'd be stricken on our behalf. What is that? That's all prophetic about the Jesus who would come. So now Zechariah is just including a prophecy of it's still 600 years from being fulfilled to one that's another 2,000 years from being fulfilled says that one who is pierced in their presence is going to come back to them and they're going to see him and they're going to receive him. Understand that the whole of the end times is really about God dealing in his first covenant relationship with Israel. Right now, he's dealing with us in that second covenant relationship we have with Jesus Christ, who is the groom and we're his bride. But God, the father, Israel is his bride. So what you're seeing in the end of times is a restoration of, of, of what would take place a return of the Jews to the land, a reestablishment of the nation to the point that in the end times, God will use that nation to reach the rest of the world. Remember in Mark 11 and Matthew 23, there's the cursing of the fig tree. There's the, and, and then he says, but watch for the blooming of the tree. Listen to the promise that God gives to Abraham and to Israel. The Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall also be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse and all the families of the earth will be blessed. Isn't it amazing how every political year, all the reporters want to know, what's your stance on Israel? What's your position on Israel? Are you going to support Israel? Well, why is that important? Because the Bible said it would be important. Because the Bible says if you don't support them, you're going to be cursed. There's a curse. If you bless them, you're going to be blessed. It's a clear distinction made out in scripture. Why is that? Put it this way. Israel's the only nation in all of history that God has ever made a covenant with. And here he makes this covenant. And for centuries, I mean centuries, listen to me. This is so important. We get this in our brain. For centuries. God-fearing, God-loving Bible teachers and theologians have been looking for the restoration of the nation of Israel. They have been looking for that dry bones to come back to life. They've been looking for that, that, that breath to be breathed upon the nation of Israel and it's taken place. In our very time, in our very season, right before our very eyes, God has blessed this nation and has put them in the presence of the world. Israel has to be intact to receive ultimately her king. When he comes back in the end times, a temple will have to be restored just like it's prophesied in scripture. And Luke, catch this. Here's this prophetic fulfillment here. You're going to conceive a son in your womb. You're going to bring forth a son. You'll call his name Jesus. He'll be great. He'll be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Remember Matthew 24. This, there's, there's no kingdom of Israel even when this promise is made. All right? There's going to be a son. We know who that was. That prophecy was fulfilled just months after this, but that prophecy had been given hundreds of years, or 600, 700, 800 years in some instances that Jesus would come and be born of a virgin. And now you see this fulfillment, but in the giving of this prophetic word, and he says, all right, he's telling me this prophecy about all these messianic prophecies is getting ready to be fulfilled in your womb. And, but I want you to understand, there's more to come. Because later on down the road, he's going to take the throne of David. There's no throne of David at this time. But there's going to be a throne of David. So there's fulfillment of a prophecy and a prophecy within another prophecy. It's just the grace of God. Only God can do that. Only God can restore a nation. Only God can raise up a people. Now, let me just break this down real quick because I, I want to close this. The Bible says pray for the priests of Jerusalem. Hope you understand a little bit why. 
We ought to pray. Why? Because whatever troubles the Jews seems to trouble the rest of the world. All right. It seems to bother the rest of the world. It's not just the oil reserve issue. Please understand it. It's also the Islamic issue. No matter what politicians say, there's an aggression against Christianity that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years of Islam against Christianity. There's been no real aggression by true believers against them. Now, there's we, what we saw, some political wars and crusaders and all those things, but that wasn't true Christianity that we're talking about. It wasn't the Jesus model for Christianity. But that's what's troubling the world today. Now what we're going to see in the end of times is that Israel will be abandoned. All those ties politically that have been made in the world will, will, will fall apart. Well, how's that going to happen? Let me break it down to you very quickly as we close this message. One, first, we know, and we'll talk about this more in the weeks to come, that there's going to be a rapture. We call it the secret rapture. In other words, in the night when nobody's looking, the church is taken out. This is, this is, this is, this is something I, I could really get off and chase some rabbits down some holy trails on, but I won't. But I know there's coming a day. Amen. Morning, night, or noon. The Bible talks about two in bed, one's taken, one's left. Two in the field, one's working, one's left. There's going to come a day when every one of you who know Jesus Christ, if you're still alive at this moment, and I believe it's soon enough for you to be alive, you're going to see the Lord's return in the sky. It's called the blessed hope. It's not the glorious appearing when everybody sees him. It's just when the saints of God are, 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 are to be received. And God takes us off the planet because the tribulations get ready to start, all right? It's getting ready to be hell on earth. And he didn't reserve that tribulation for us. And so every child of God, those who know Jesus Christ, now catch this. Can you imagine you look up in the moment, here comes Christ, our Savior and King, riding on a horse. And with him are the angelic armies of God. And with him are every saint who's ever died in history. Every child of God. They're, they are coming back with him, clothed in glory, and as they appear over the planet. I mean, this beats Star Wars or anything else. <laughs> you know, Independence Day, you ain't got nothing on this. All right. As he appears over the planet, <clears throat> every grave, every place of any person ever laid to rest in any fashion, there's going to be this molecular regeneration. The Bible calls it the glorification that takes place. Every part, every parcel is going to be raised up for those dead saints and their bodies are literally going to be reincorporated in a grander fashion than they've ever known. They're going to have glorified bodies like Jesus had when he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Go ahead and praise the Lord. That's what I praise the Lord. All right. If you had my back problems, you'd be praising the Lord more than that. <laughs> now, this, this Bible says, in an instant, this happened. Bam! All right, it's not going to be slow-mo. And you're not going to have, have time to make a phone call. Oh, I had Hilda. By the way, you ought to get saved. Something's going on. <laughs> this is faster than speed dial. And the Bible says, in that moment, now when the dead in Christ are raised, it says, then we which are still alive in Christ, that we're going to be going up together with them into the air to meet the Lord and ever be with the Lord and with them. What a grand reunion. What a glorious time, you know. I think I could chase some trails, but we won't. It's, hey, that happens. I just don't believe that, but you will. All right. You better, I ain't button my seatbelt. I'm going out, all right. I don't be anything holding me back, but believe it. Then what happens, because the presence of, of, of this, this moral conscience called the church, all right, people who love God, people who, who want to stand for righteousness, people who, who hate, you know, injustice and immorality and ungodliness and racism and all the things, the, the moral fiber of, 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 you know, people who want to embrace the word of God and the, the Ten Commandments, you know, the basic principles for living. Those people are gone. So all of a sudden now you have all this unrestrained evil in the world. And ultimately, the Bible says it comes against the Jews. Now, what happens, Israel begins to experience a lot of frustration. Somewhere in this, we probably see, if not even sooner, uh, the war, the battle of Gog and Magog. It's mentioned, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago in, in Ezekiel. And, and what happens in that battle is all these nations together against them, led by a northern power, which is a pretty accurate description of a great bear from the north. God comes down, Russia, it looks like, led in a, in a, there's a coalition between him and all these Islamic nations, it looks like, that take place. And remember, half that USSR was those Islamic nations, all right? So it's Russia's attempt to kind of gather their little puppies back together. It's, their, it's not in their mind to do that. It's in their mind to destroy Israel. But anyway, you say, there's no way that's going to happen. Hey, we thought that 
I thought that a decade ago, but you know, when I woke up one day and saw that Russia built a base in Syria, I said, ah, here we are. Here we are. It's all coming together. It's all happening. Look at all this love now between the, between the, between the Arab nations and, and all of a sudden the Russians. So anyway, during this battle, God intervenes. You know, and God starts moving. So Israel starts, re, you know, looking forward to this, this, this miraculous aid that happens. Also, remember, because there's such chaos, now the Antichrist is navigating a scene to world attention. He enters into the scenario and says, hey, I have an answer for this chaos in the world. I have a, I have, I, let's make a deal. And he, he institutes some kind of seven-year peace plan, it talks about in the Bible, that brings peace to the Middle East for about a period of a few years. It's not long. All right, so that takes place. And after that battle of Gog and Magog, I mean, that big invasion takes place. It's like God, it's like a limited nuclear blast takes place on the hills around Israel to, to save the nation of Israel. And so they're saved. It says, so Israel will know that I'm the Lord God says. So there's this great victory and the Jews see, this, see what God does and they begin to see what's happened in the past because you can see some of that in those wars I talked about. They get this miracle mentality and they start looking to God for answers in the middle of all this. Romans, Paul talked about, remember a blindness that would come in part to the Jews? That was that cursing of the fig tree. Yeah, a lot of Jews have come to Jesus Christ, but as a whole, they've rejected the Messiah completely. But it does say that the time is coming when the time of the Gentiles, our church age, after the rapture, apparently, when we get out of here, you know, that God's going to deliver Israel. He's going to come from Zion and they're going to see and, and they're going to be looking for Messiah and he's going to come and do a tremendous and supernatural work in their life. In fact, Romans goes on to say, and Israel will be saved. And you say, I thought the Bible said 144,000 Jews would be saved. Is there a contradiction? Well, when he talks about Israel being saved, he's talking about their ultimate, the state will not be destroyed. The, the Jewish people collectively will not be conquered. He'll save them. But in the midst of all that, starting this great redemptive work in Israel, there are 144,000 who, who, who give their life to Jesus and become global evangelists for the gospel. And they preach the gospel. You say, well, Brother Joe, I thought the church is gone. So if the church is gone, you know, how can they get saved? I mean, because the spirit's gone. The Bible doesn't say the spirit leaves. I hate to tell you this, but the spirit's omnipresent. All right. The spirit was down at Joe's bar and grill last night. As well as ears this morning. Why? Because he's everywhere. Now, is he blessing, moving, ministering, giving grace? That never, doesn't seem to be because they don't let him, right? But God's moving. And what happens is, you know, there, there's only two ways to get saved according to scripture. One, the spirit draws you, right? You have the witness of the spirit. No man can come, but the spirit draws him. And then you have to have the word of God. Paul said, how can they believe if they don't hear the word of God? And how are they going to hear it if we don't send them? So you have to have the word and you have to have the spirit. And so how are they going to get that? Got to be somebody to give it to them. Well, God thinks of everything. Be sure that nothing's left out when God starts working and God starts moving because he, he, he sets it up. You know, and, and there's the witness of the spirit. And Ezekiel says, I won't hide from my, my face from anymore. There won't be this obscurity. There won't be this blindness in any part because I'm going to pour up my spirit on the house of Israel. So the spirit of God starts working in the people's hearts. And then he sends witnesses of the word. I will grant authority to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, this is another story. I mean, these guys show up and I believe it's Moses and Elijah. It doesn't say people have different opinions. I believe Moses and Elijah because they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, remember? And when Jesus reveals his glory and the disciples, you know, uh, you know, Peter and John are gathered there and they're looking on, they're freaked out and they see the glory of God manifest and they see two witnesses there to attest to the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is who he says he is. And one is Moses and one is Elijah. They take the word and they're preaching in the streets of Jerusalem, all right? Ultimately, you know, the, the Antichrist and his cohorts, they want him dead. But hey, these, they win these, these people to Christ and 144,000 of them, 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel go out and they preach the gospel, all right? The Bible tells us prophetically the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all nations. Now, we have almost done that as the church, but we haven't finished the task, all right? The gospel of the kingdom, it says, must be preached to all nations. You say, what do you mean? It was the preaching of the Gentile, to the Gentiles by those first century Jews for 2,000 years. But what was preached? It's called the gospel of peace, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now there's this gospel that says of the kingdom. All right, what was the gospel of the kingdom? Well, that was the message of John the Baptist. Repent, kingdom of God's at hand. 
Elijah, Moses, the 144,000, they're going to be preaching to the nations, repent, the kingdom of God's at hand. <laughs> it's upon us and it's about to happen. The king is coming. Now, this is that time of tribulation, all right? And the world's in chaos. Antichrist is fighting for his place to be the rightful ruler. He's entered now into the throne, uh, to the, uh, the throne of, and to the temple and declared himself to be God. Now there's a resistance from him as well, from other people in the world. But if this whole, during this time, there's these thousands of people out preaching. I mean, look at the parallels. Who were the first century messengers? They were the Jews, the apostles, right? Who were the last century messengers? Well, they'll be the Jews, all right? 144,000 of them. Yeah. It's, it's like Jonah when he first refuses to preach to Nineveh. Then he encounters a disaster in his life and then God delivers him in his encounter and he meets with God and he does what he's supposed to do. Well, who are they going to evangelize? Just Jews? No, they'll evangelize Jews and Gentiles according to the scripture. All right. In fact, there's just two kinds of folks in the world, not Jews and Gentiles, they're really just lost and saved. People that know Christ and people that don't know Christ. That's why it's important you give your life to Christ now. You don't want to be saved in the tribulation because you, you're saved in the tribulation. It's at the cost of your life, you know? And millions will be saved in the tribulation, but it's going to cost them their lives. Listen to what John says, and he's in heaven, and the Lord's given him a preview, all right? This is the movie trailer of the end times he's watching. And he says, after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. And they stood before the throne and before the lamb. They're clothed in white robes and they have palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, salvation to our God who sits upon the throne unto the lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts. And they fell before the throne of their faces and they worshiped God saying, amen and blessing and glory and wisdom and honor, thanksgiving, honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever continuing to say amen and to praise the Lord. And it says, one of the elders said to me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and where'd it come from? And I said to him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and they've washed their robes and made them white by the blood of the lamb. This is what Israel's doing in the end times, reaching these millions of people, just as it was in the first, is the way it ends. In Revelation 20, it says it this way, I saw the thrones, you know, and I, click the clicker here, and I saw the thrones and they set upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast nor his image and neither had received his mark upon their forehands or on their heads and they lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. Man, do you see the parallels and the beauty of it? You know, when Christ came the first time, those first century believers, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't do that. You can't call Jesus Lord. You know, you, uh, Caesar hated Christians for this very purpose. I don't mind you having other lords, but I am the Lord, you know. And those first century believers, many of them were martyrs for Christ. They lost their lives because they wouldn't declare that Caesar was Lord, not Jesus. All right? They, 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 they died a tremendous death. But in the end, it's going to be the same. You know? These Jewish evangelists go out again. They preach the gospel. And what happens in this last time? Hey, they lose their lives for the sake of the gospel of the kingdom. It all begins in the Garden of Eden. It all ends in the Garden of Eternity. It all began in the Middle East, in the Garden of Eden. It all ends in that place in the end of times. You may be sitting here today and say, you know, Pastor Joe, there's, you know, that, that stuff about the, the Antichrist, the beast and all that. There's no way I'd ever call the devil or his, or his puppet, you know, the Antichrist, in which ultimately he completely consumes and fills his life. I'd never call him Lord. But we do so, so many times in our lives when we refuse to let Jesus be the Lord of our life. I mean, it, doesn't the Bible draw two very distinct paths? It, 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 according to, to have a biblical view of the world, it means there's a way that leads to life and heaven and salvation, and there's a way that leads to hell and death and judgment. Jesus says, there's many on that road. Over here on this life justice path, there's a few. Jesus declares, you know, how do you get here? I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I, I'm inundated constantly as well as you are with a skeptical, cynical, sarcastic world who has no hope and no belief system. But I want you to know, if your belief system is founded in the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
And you need to be declaring him the Lord daily in your life. You need to be confessing him daily in your life. You need to be one of those fiery evangelists in these end times that God can use while we have the time that God has given us. There are marked times on God's calendar. I'm doing this at this time. I'm doing this at this time. I'm doing this at this time. Jesus gave an overview. Here's what it's going to be like in the last of the time. He says, by the way, you really want to know when I'm getting close? He says, watch the fig tree. When the fig tree blooms, my coming is near, even at the door. This is what he said. When you see that fig tree bloom, that generation will not pass away. Well, how long is a generation? Well, biblically, a generation can be anywhere from 40 to 80 years. We haven't reached the end of that generation yet. Yeah. If I'm wrong in my understanding of scripture, I'm wrong in a great way. <laughs> I don't believe I am. But if you take 30 AD all the way into 1948, all these things have happened. We've seen all these things that Jesus talked about. But the end is not yet. Don't worry. But he said, it's going to be like a woman in travail. And when birth pangs start, and then what has happened since 1948? You can look at history. You can go on the internet, whatever you want to do. And you'll discover that since 1948, all these wars, all these rumors of wars, all these earthquakes, all these famines, all these pestilence, all this nation against nation and race against race is what it really says in one translation. All that bigotry, all the hatred, all the animosity. He said it just begins to exponentially. And literally since 1948, there's been this exponential explosion of all these things, all these events, whether it's been the pestilence or the earthquakes. I mean, it's just phenomenal. You can't deny it. You can try, but you're just wasting your time. I know one thing. I believe with all my heart, Jesus came as prophesied by the prophets. And I believe with all my heart, Jesus is coming again as prophesied by the hearts. The day we will not know nor the hour. But he says, you can understand the seasons. You know that when it's summer, this is what goes on. When it's fall, the leaves are falling. Hey, when it's winter, it's cold. Hey, just watch what's going on around you. He said, you can know the season. I believe we're in that season. I believe we need to have hearts that are ready. Let's stand with our heads bowed.